Welcome to the Day at Indy on the Marshall Pro Podcast, brought to you by Cooper Tires and the Justice Brothers, May 11th, Indianapolis Grand Prix in the books. Well, that was predictable. Ha! Huh. <laughs> uh, what a crazy and fun race. The sixth edition, absolutely nothing. Well, I thought I had it picked. Someone asked me before the race who I was going to choose. I said Scott Dixon especially if it rains and unfortunately they set the race for 85 laps i was right for 83 and three quarter laps simon pagino though puts in the drive that we knew he's capable of because he's done this so many times before sports cars indy cars you name it that man was truly something spectacular to behold on the way to his first win about a year and a half yeah, I saw him after the race and said hey you know what that reminded me of and he said Senna and I said no well, that's his hero so of course we would want him to be associated with Senna I said it was a classic Simon Pagano performance that's what it reminded me of having seen him do that in the American Le Mans series at Le Mans in IndyCar even you name it throw that guy in adverse conditions and something where you have to think your way through, feel your way through, have really fast reflexes, deal with a car that's sliding around that you know is not knife edge, something where the grip can just go away instantly, but something that you can feel starting to slide, giving you that telegraph a little bit sooner than, say, a car starting to slide in the dry. That's when you have a super happy, super effective Simon Pagano, weird race in the sense that Andretti Autosport really was nowhere. Uh, Felix Rosenquist showed pretty good stuff uh, early on, but then definitely suffered and went backwards pretty heavily. Plummeted, won a pair of the Zach Veach Flame Out Award on the Indy Pit Lane. So very interesting to see that happen for Felix as well. Great, I would say great day as a whole for Ed Carpenter Racing. Wonderful to see Ed Jones so racy, passing the guy who replaced him in Felix Rosenquist. Spencer Piggott, really strong performance too. Jack Harvey, amazing, his first podium. Michael Shank's first podium, who's coming up here as our main guest momentarily. Scott Dixon didn't get the win he thought he was going to have. Another second place here, three in a row. For second place is at the Indy GP, but moves him into second over on the championship. Joseph Newgarden, a tough day, plummeted. So just six points separating Newgarden in the points lead and Dixon now. Had a lot of questions come in regarding the really, really long yellow. Trying to understand what happened there. Why was that almost 15 minutes of time consumed? And got a note after asking IndyCar, and they said the, uh, the first pace car really wasn't in position to pick up the leader. Had to wait until the next time around. Uh, the wave by had a pretty big gap in the field. Um, just a variety of things where they had to do a couple of things that ended up extending the caution longer than necessary. Not saying I understand all of it, but at least in some of the answers that I was given, easier to understand why getting things corralled, getting cars in the right position, picking up the cars in the right spot, took a few extra laps, added some time, obviously, when you're going relatively slow on a somewhat long road course. So, again, not perfect, but, uh, yeah, hopefully that adds a little bit of context to what happened there. So we'll go a little bit deeper here when we get to the middle of the week in our Week in Indy episode, but I want to give you a quick little recap of some of the things of interest, for me at least, for our day in Indy. And now let's roll into our man, awesome, awesome interview from Michael Shank. All thanks to him. And then we're going to follow with today's Indy Lights winner, that being Renus VK from Who Goes Racing, all brought to you by Cooper Tires and the Justice Brothers. Michael Shank, you are a man walking around holding proudly your very first trophy in the NTT IndyCar Series, and you have a mostly empty bottle of champagne you have brought here to our little mobile podcast studio. 
so happy for you, my friend. Thank you. Tell me about this. Well, first of all, that's only the beginning of tonight. I'm going to be very drunk tonight, so I'm looking forward to that. But, you know, Marshall, I tell you, uh, you've known me a long time. You've, uh, we've talked through a lot of things. We've gone through your friend's passing. We've, you know, plus and minus to the whole world and racing here. But uh, for me, growing up a kid, getting the Indianapolis Star every month in the month of May and listening to the radio, listening to Johnny Rutherford and the boys go around and, I don't know. It's just the best place in the world you could possibly have your first podium. And um, I, I give I give all the credit to the plan from Mike Culliver, the driver, Jack Carvey, the team, the crew chief, Adam Rovazzini. These guys communicated so well this weekend. They could not be denied. We had a little bungle on our first pit stop, but the last two were really clean. And, uh, and we called the right strategy today. And um, what I feel is just immense proud. I just feel proud. And, uh, you know, we're only doing 10 races this year and uh, very unlikely to do more. I've gotten that question a lot this weekend and tonight. Maybe you should do 37 races this year yeah, if, if I, this is what it's going to be like. Remember, I like to drink bush light and sit on my pontoon, but I just got a new pontoon <laughs> with a 400 racing mercury on it. So <laughs> I want to drive savage. my perk. I want to drink bush light and I want to ride on my pontoon. But <laughs> <laughs> that's where I'll be at Detroit. We just have your we have your gravestone based off of that quote going forward, you madman. Uh, listen, you know, um, just so much support in AutoNation, Sirius XM, and Honda. You know, Honda's got a great package right now. Tasha, we have one of the two female uh, tuners, and I love her. She's she's awesome, and um, the whole plan came together. And I think if it stayed dry, maybe getting ahead of myself here a little. If it would have stayed dry, I think we had a P two car challenging for P one. So this kid, Jack Harvey, I watched him intently in Indy Lights and saw something that impressed me heavily. Also left a couple questions, though, coming into IndyCar, and that was, in Indy Lights, this kid would absolutely go forward in a motor race. Might not have been the best qualifier at all times. Wasn't always someone that could overturn a slow weekend. But we definitely saw that in a race, this kid attacked and attacked and attacked. So that we knew was going to be something you could work with. Seen him last year. You and I spoke. Some flashes. Not sure I saw the evolution that I was expecting from him. That's fair. Coming into 19, though, again, I know the finishing results haven't been everything you wanted until today it looks like he's starting to latch on to that thing those kernels we saw in indy lights we wouldn't base an assessment on this one race at the indy gp but across the first handful of races are you seeing that extra whatever it is that he seems to maybe unlock tell you what we need to talk about here is expectations marshall and uh, we have a reasonable budget, but not over the top by any means. We did as much testing as we could, and we set expectations as this. Transfer every time. Uh, goal number one. Okay, we've transferred three or five times now. Didn't even talk about a top six. We got one of those now in qualifying. That Firestone F- Fast Six transfer in. Fin- finish in the top. Yeah, finish in the, that's right. Finish in the top ten every time we can. We've done that three or five times now. Those goals are met. We've made some mistakes, both sides, a team and driver. Um, but what I've always said about Jack, um, he is working exceptionally hard at this. They've talked a lot about 26 pounds he, he lost, which is fine. You know, he doesn't need to lose anymore. I, I oh. need to match him in that, if not <laughs> times 10. Well, listen. So uh, he's done, and he's working, and he deserves this. He deserves an opportunity. And he came through the ranks, just like we talked about. And, um, and I think what you're going to see, if you think about how Newgarden came in and the time it took him to kind of get yep. matured, couple is that a good years. word? A couple maybe? of years. Uh, you look at Rossi even, at Rossi until he wanted Indy. You know, it was, I remember watching him in 17 and he finished eighth in 17 when I was with Andretti. I was on their stand. And um, you, look at, uh, you look at Jack's progression, I'd say it's on track. Okay. Um, but we got a lot more. And, um, and both on the team side and, and Jack's side, we're going to keep working at it. And, uh, but the big thing is is making sure that uh, AutoNation and Sirius XM stay committed to us. And uh, we're up, our contract's up, so we need to work on that, try to get to a, a full season. That was the next place I wanted to go here. And looking at Jack, knowing that if you're talking to both of those companies and more, yep. 
you definitely have something really good to put in front of them. So let's fast track those things. Let's, let's get that signed by tomorrow if we can. But um, every team has sponsors. They're, I would say, almost equally as valuable to most teams. But there are some teams like your own where an Auto Nation, a Sirius XM, they're kind of sort of the difference between being here or not being here. Yeah. There's some other teams where they've lost sponsors. We know some teams, maybe the owners are wealthy businessmen, put their own money in. There are a handful of teams like yours, though, where take those logos off the car, you're taking the car off the track. What's that like, working with them, knowing how extra meaningful they are to your existence, um, and then giving them something like this as a reason to stay committed for more? Listen, I mean, the commitment they made to us is far beyond a sponsor, right, or a marketing partner. They're true team owners in a, in a sense, right? They don't have a- actual equity legally, but they're behind us. And they said, hey, listen, we're behind you. We think you do a good job for us, not only on the track, but behind the scenes and social media stuff. But, but we need results, and I get that. So we, we push we push him hard to get these results. If we get the results, we have a real chance of getting these guys to commit further. Uh, we need to have a case for when they go to their boards and they talk about why we're doing this and how we're doing this. We've got to say we have a highly successful team that deserves to be here full time, and we need to spend X for the next three years. So, Let's talk about race engineers. Yeah. Last year, when you did your six races, yep. had a deal with the Aerosmith Peterson Motorsports team where you were using Will Anderson, who was stepping up into race engineering yep. role for the first time. Yep. They obviously had a little bit of uh, engineering turnover and yep. change. Jack and Will were doing good things together, but still learning at yep. the same time. All true. Will moved back uh, with Hinch. You now have Mike Colliver, who's been yeah. a, a veteran of the sport, maybe not always a frontline name like some of the other race engineers who are seemingly on every race broadcast, but that doesn't mean he isn't a talented guy. Tell us about having maybe, say, a more senior race engineer step in and what we're seeing with that veteran experience. Maybe maybe Mike helping coach up Jack a little bit more? Is that part of what we've seen this well, year? Well, first of all, one thing, a bit of trivia that you're going to love uh, Mike worked for me in all of 2013, and you know who that drove for him in me? is Justin. Justin. Justin drove with Gustavo as a co-driver for most of the 2013 season in that car. The big man. Mike. And Mike and I got along great. Just after we stopped in 13, we only had one car to run in DP at the time, and we went on. Here's what I like about Mike. Mike is an analog guy in the digital world, mm. okay? And, 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 and the plus to that is that he still writes stuff down right it's not all in the laptop (laughs) and uh, what he's best at what he's best at is managing jack Mm. i think he's really good at keeping it real you know what i'm saying like he doesn't add a lot of layers that don't need complexity layers that he needs to and what i'm what i'm really finding out and this really showed this weekend about mike mike had a plan this weekend and there was no guessing it was bang 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 on changes all through practice we came out of the box quick um, every session we kind of advanced, and then you saw a really quick race car in qualifying, right? A fraction away from being on pole. So um, Mike, Mike is part of the SPM technical package, but I did have a say in who they got. Will moved on because he had a full-time opportunity. That's all good. So we didn't know exactly where we are going to land, but we landed pretty damn well. I'm happy with it. Start to wind up here, Mike, looking at how you take today's achievement and use it to your benefit as we roll out of the Indy GP. Yep. Two days from now, yep. we're going to be, or whatever, a couple days from now, we're going to be starting practice for the 500. That's right. Then you're going to be moving on to the rest of your part-time, but still pretty yep. solid schedule. Is that a thing? Is there something a team can do after a big first result like this to ensure it helps going forward or is that just one of those mythological things we talk about but you can't really harness no i think you know the momentum we're going to take out of this and i hear jack talking in the background but um he he will be very solid next week i think you'll see it It might take a little couple days to get it all kind of sussed out we're good at the test i think this is the only way we could possibly i mean just i couldn't ask for a better way to enter the indy 500 if we're standing here after the Indy 500 P3 or better, you're going to have one happy client here, one happy guy. And uh, I think it means a ton. 
but it's it's the team can do it. I told Robin this the other day. It's I, do we belong here? Yes, proved it today, and we're just starting. We're just we're just you know I'm 50 years old. I got I got more time here, and I want to build this thing right, and uh, hopefully run two cars at the speedway next year would be a nice little dream. And um, but for sure, the number one priority is to run the whole season with Jack, and and he deserve he just deserves it, you know. You being Midwest boy, Ohio born and bred, have you seen or felt, Mike, coming into IndyCar, the fact that I believe, folks, the more you are doing interviews, podcasts with whomever, video pieces, I don't know if you've recognized this, I don't know if you've felt it, starting to become kind of sort of the people's champ, you know? There, we got a lot of great drivers, I don't know if too many fans feel like they're I like they could go have a beer with most well, IndyCar car drivers. <laughs> oh me anyway. But you on the other hand. <laughs> yeah, they definitely could. You do you feel that yet? Do you appreciate that? Because um, I think folks are seeing you as, as one of them making good. Well I do feel that a little bit because I am. I'm a Midwest guy that uh, went to high school, didn't go to college, uh, clawed my way uh, to where we're at today and uh, um, had great people, have great people uh, to help build it. And um, I want people to feel like they have access to me. Um, I don't feel like it's too much. Um, I think one of those people could hold the keys to something someday for us. And so I'm nice to people to be nice, but you know, there's always, there's always people trying to help and, um, an opportunity sometimes pops you in the face when those happens. But mostly though, I just want people to want to support us. When I, when people come up to me here, I thank them because, uh, they're taking their time to think about us and, and their lives and whatever they got going on. They're actually thinking about Jack Harvey today or Mario Fombacher last weekend at Mid Ohio or whatever whatever that looks like. You know, um, I'm I'm just I'm just freaking grateful. I'm pinching myself. I was you know not long ago I was in Toyota Atlantic in the early 2000s and didn't know how we were going to survive. Uh, and to to see where we're at now on the pylon and, and um, I mean that I mean, come on that's 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 it. <laughs> Six days ago, podium, IMSA race at yep. Mid Ohio and GTD, fighting, scrapping for the win. Points here, lead now. Exactly. Here yep. we are with Acura. Here yep. we are. Yep. Indianapolis Grand Prix, third place with yep. Jack Harvey. Big momentum shift internally. Happy for you, my friend, because I you. know you've earned this. No one's given you a damn thing. You've yeah. earned this. And when someone who has worked their way up to make this happen, starting to make things truly come together i think i hope most folks celebrate i hope so i appreciate it marshall thank you buddy and for any of those who are listening and you're coming to gasoline alley whether the doors open or not just as mike said leave those six packs whatever it is bush lights bush lights. Put them outside the door we'll drink them come have a beer with michael shank and the meyer shank racing team brother happy That's for you and uh hopefully we'll have you back here on another day at indy before the end of the month can't wait man can't wait thanks and that was Michael Shank after his team's first podium in IndyCar. Coming up next, and to close our show, we have Renus VK grabbed his second Indy Lights victory of the year. This kid from Holland, I think, is destined for some pretty big things in IndyCar. Might come to him very soon, whether he wins the championship or not. And some very good support from his native country. Uh, definitely someone who looks like he is locked in to some Hopefully, big things and a long, long career in IndyCar. Renus VK, you just put in a clinic, winning your second Indy Lights race of the year. I'd love to ask you about the big battles you had, all the tough competition, what it was like going wheel to wheel, lap after lap. That wasn't your experience, my man. I mean, you checked out, you built some, you built a beautiful gap. Tell me about this victory here at Indianapolis to open up your month of May. Uh, yeah, it was actually a great race. Um, it, I had a battle in the first lap, though, with uh, Robert, Robert McGinnis, my enough. teammate. And uh, it was quite close, actually. And then um, for the rest, it was just me trying to be as consistent and faultless as possible. So, uh, yeah, it was, of course far from easy this race but uh i enjoyed every every lap and um yeah i'm so happy to have my first win ever on ims now knowing that you had success 
right out of the gate at St. Petersburg. Obviously, Oliver Askew then followed up with some, some success. Robert McGinnis won his first race yesterday. We're at a place now, or so, still somewhat early in the Indy Lights season, where we've now got a couple of really good winners. We can see the championship starting to form. What are your thoughts at this stage, at least knowing there's a couple of you standing out, letting the world know we're probably going to be focusing on you most heavily for the rest of the year? You feel like there's a good fight coming? Yeah, of course. I think uh, um, the field isn't too big in any car, uh, in any lights. I mean, <laughs> but um, no, the, the the level is super high, and um, yeah, I, I think uh, the last two seasons I've had a lot of fun racing against Robin McGinnis and Oliver Askew, and uh, we all grow together throughout the whole uh, road to Indy. And, um, of course, the racing stays even as fun as it was before. Let's talk about the opening portion of the first lap. And, again, you did check out. You put in one of those classic races where it's like you have to ask the guys on the podium how their races went because you weren't really there to see it. Yeah, at least they got lots of screens here. See? So that's beautiful. I, I could watch the race All right, in that, the that, car. That, no, that would be hilarious. Um <laughs> What I appreciated about the opening lap, especially through the first set of corners before you went on to the back straight, is there was some really hard, tough wheel-to-wheel -wheel with Robert McGinnis. Yes. Completely fair, though. And I think at this level, that's not only important to see, but important to demonstrate to future team owners that, guess what? I'm not going to give an inch to anyone, but I'm also not going to treat them unfairly. No, of course. I think that's also... Uh the way American racing wants to see it and um, um, yeah it's it's it even feels great to um, to go wheel to wheel and give each other room and pass someone with giving him enough room to stay there so uh, yeah um, it isn't as nice always but uh, at least um, yeah I'm having a great weekend and uh, yeah took over the championship lead and I cannot wait to uh, to challenge the Freedom 100 Oval uh, in two weeks. And that's where I wanted to go next on both points and the big oval. This Andretti Autosport team coming off of 2018, a 1-2 in the championship with Pato and Colton obviously coming in this year very strong. Your team Hunkos Racing, strong pedigree as well, championship winning team. Maybe not the big size though in terms of lots of, of front running cars. What's it like, at least this early stage, to be holding the points lead, knowing that it's kind of Renus versus the world almost? Yeah, it's uh, it's really nice. It's giving me a, a little bit of a kick also, um, because um, I'm really trying to stop the Andretti show a little bit. So, um, yeah, the Andretti's are super strong, and um, I didn't expect any difference from them. But um, I chose for Junkers Racing just to be different and to uh, to challenge them and uh, even try to beat him uh, beat them and um, yeah it's it's going uh, all the right way now and uh, being championship leader with uh, with Junkers racing and uh, having two uh, 200 cars behind me or 300 cars behind me so uh, yeah it, it's great and uh, well we're nowhere yet it's still the start of the season and um, of course this gives me a kick to uh, to keep, keep on this uh, good results. Let's close on what's coming up next for you here in two weeks or so, that being the Freedom 100. If I'm looking at Andretti Autosport with their lights drivers, obviously they can look upward and see Michael Andretti, who led a trillion laps here, Hunter Ray, winner of the race, Alexander Rossi, winner of the race. Just looking in terms of coaching and advisement, learning about this big oval and how to compete around it they have some great resources what do you have for you in terms of having to master this oval discipline as a part of your career arc who do you have within hunkos that might be able to help you is that other crazy dutch guy who maybe won here a couple times who seems to like you a little bit mr lion dyke is he someone who might you know be help coach or otherwise Yes, uh, of course, Ari is, uh, is someone who, uh, who has a lot of experience and who I have by my side. And um, he doesn't 
talk too much to me because um, he wants to let the team do his thing. But whenever he uh, sees the opportunity to uh, give me a tip or teach me something, he, he is right there. And um, yeah, I think uh, the whole team, uh, my engineer, uh, Jensi Diotalevi, is a really good guy. And um, he knows how to set up a car also on the ovals. So um, yeah, I got a good pair of guys behind me and also uh, my uh, my driver coach Jonathan George who actually worked for Oliver Eskew's uh, Oliver Eskew in the past two years um, where I was the big rival of Oliver uh, now works for me and um, yeah he is a very special guy and uh, he really helps me uh, be successful this uh, this season and I cannot wait to uh, yeah, to win together with all those guys in, uh, yeah, hopefully the Freedom 100. So I know that you were, you and so many other drivers on the road to Indy were just running out of patience in the long gap from opening the season to having to come here and get back to business. I know that you, as a road racer, were loving the chance to get to race in the Indy GP. Tell us as, as we close here, Renus, your thoughts about getting to now get to the thing that everyone comes to Indianapolis for, the big oval race weekend. How excited are you about that? Oh, I'm very excited. I think uh, it's, for now, the most important race of my career. So, um, yeah, it's it's many people who, uh, who are going to watch me. And, uh, of course... There is some pressure with all those people on the on the grandstands, but uh, still, it's just racing. It's just uh, also a matter of having fun, and um, yeah, I cannot wait to go. Uh, well, how many cars? N- nine wide, or <laughs> how, how wide we can go uh, into turn one? So yeah, I'm uh, really looking forward, and um, yeah, I got a good kick of confidence uh, for for the for the oval. Renus, keep doing what you're doing, man. So happy to see you and just this talent. So much talent in the road to Indy, but just to see that talent telling the world we're coming. Happy for you, son. Yeah, thank you very much. Going to take Sunday off, so our next day at Indy will come on Monday, and we're going to hear some news from Ricardo Junco's. Not a long episode but something with our pal Ricardo Junco, some news that he shared with me. We'll be back to you on Monday with the next episode of The Day at Indy, brought to you by Cooper Tires and the Justice Brothers.